Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the revelation of the mystery. We thank you for the dispensation of grace. We thank you for salvation as a free gift. Help us to be faithful to your word. Help us to preach it clearly and accurately. And we pray, Lord, that you would just continue to add to the body of Christ. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. So, let's start with this. You know, is, is mid-Acts dispensationalism true? Or asked another way, are, are, are you in some cult meeting in a barn? <laughs> you, you know, in other words, wh- what are you doing? Why are you here if you're tuning in whatever for? And the reason why is simply this. Conventional thinking in Christianity is that Peter and the Twelve teach the exact same thing as Paul. Paul comes along later because he's rebellious. He's persecuting the church in early Acts. But people think that once the Lord appears to him and Paul gets saved, then Paul is just really another member of the Twelve. And he goes to the same people, and he has the same message, and his ministry is not different. That is the widespread thinking throughout Christianity. That's, that's almost nearly universally believed, right? Paul is just later on, but he's doing the exact same thing. Well, is that true? Get with me. Let's go to Ephesians 3, and we'll start there. Now, as we look at Ephesians 3, I'll say this. If Paul has the exact same ministry and the exact same message as Peter and the Twelve, then, then mid-Acts dispensationalism is just wrong. And most of the things that we're doing don't make a whole lot of sense. But what I want to do is I just want to spend some time with you in Ephesians 3, and we're just going to read it for what it says. We're going to take it at its face value. And does it or does it not prove that Paul had a new revelation that was distinct from the Twelve? That's the question I want to consider. And what we're going to do is we're going to first look at that, and then we're going to look at some common objections that people levy against the mid-Acts dispensational position. So verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now, Paul says he's a prisoner for the Gentiles. That's exactly what he says. You should keep in mind that the Lord's earthly ministry, when he sent out the twelve, he specifically said in Matthew 10, go not into the way of the Gentiles. Now, that's important because what happens is people want to say that Peter and Paul have the same ministry, But if words mean things, which they do, then his ministry is different. At minimum, it involves a different audience. Verse 2, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Now, isn't the natural sense of that verse that the dispensation of the grace of God was given to Paul? Isn't that exactly what it says. Does that verse make a lot of sense if the dispensation of grace had previously been given to someone else? Wouldn't that be an odd thing to say? Well, the the whole thrust of that verse is that there was a particular dispensation, a particular body of information given to Paul, given me, to you word. Paul was very much like Moses, where what God did with Moses is God gave information to Moses, not to put in a safe deposit box, but to do what? To distribute to Israel, right? Moses was a prophet that was given information from God that he was then to communicate to Israel. Well, the same thing, is, or a similar thing is true with Paul, where the dispensation of the grace of God was given me to you word that he was then to share with humanity. 
Now notice verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now you know from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, that the word mystery means hidden wisdom. So a mystery is wisdom, but what kind of wisdom? It's wisdom that's hidden, it's concealed. There's something about it that has been hidden. Verse 3 says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. What people commonly think is they think that what Paul does is he preaches the exact same thing as Peter, he just starts later. But verse 3 disproves that, doesn't it? When, when it says, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, what was Paul doing in Acts 7 and 8? He was persecuting the church. And Paul was persecuting the church because of their doctrine. Paul wasn't persecuting the church because he didn't like Jewish people. Paul was Jewish, right? A member of the tribe of Benjamin. The, the reason that Saul, subsequently called Paul, was persecuting the church is he viewed them as heretics who needed to be persecuted because of their doctrine. So then think through this with me. Did Paul need revelation from God the Father to know what Peter and the Twelve were preaching. He already knew it, and that is the very reason he was persecuting them. So what does verse 3 tell you? How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. The mystery cannot possibly be what Peter and the Twelve were teaching since Paul already knew it. He knew their doctrine, and that is the very reason he was persecuting them. Now my point is we're only three verses into Ephesians 3. But when people say, well, Paul was doing the exact same thing as Peter, well, did you read any of the verses? Or did you just, do you just believe things that sound nice? What happens in, in a lot of life is there's a lot of conventional wisdom that's just stuff that people believe. It's not necessarily factual. It's not necessarily true. It's just stuff that is widely widely taught, widely thought to be true. And what happens is you, you sort of just have to decide in life, am I going to choose what I believe based upon what scholars tell me or what I heard on the radio or what a majority of my friends believe, or am I going to believe the infallible authority of God's Word? Because what happens is you're not going to be able to do both. You're not going to be able to both believe God's Word and the conventional thinking of man, because they're different. So we're in verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand, notice what it says, my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Wasn't well, the sense of that verse that Paul had knowledge that was different from Peter and the Twelve? Why would he call it my knowledge in the mystery of Christ? Verse 5, notice this which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What you have probably heard someone say at some point, today we are saved looking backward to the cross, just as in time past everyone was saved looking forward to the cross. Well, that sounds spiritual, but is that true? Did God say to Noah, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved? It's not what he said. You can't find that anywhere in Genesis. What he told him was, I'm going to flood the earth. If you don't build an ark, what's going to happen? You're going to drown. He didn't say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
Now, Paul says in Acts 16, so look at me, look at, we'll come back to Ephesians 3, but look at Acts 16. Acts chapter 16. Acts 16, verse 30. This is when Paul's in a jail in Philippi. The jailer in verse 30 says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Obviously the most important question of life. Verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So they tell the Philippian jailer to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. The word gospel means good news, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel that Paul taught is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Is that the gospel that Peter and the Twelve taught before the cross? Look with me at Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 31. Mark 9, 31. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Mark 9, shortly before the cross, the Lord is speaking to his disciples, and he tells them, he specifically tells them, the Son of Man, i.e. the Lord Jesus Christ, He's going to be delivered to be killed, and He's going to rise again the third day. Look at verse 32. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask Him. Now forget man's wisdom for a minute. Just focus on the Word of God. Did the twelve understand the cross before the cross. Not according to Mark 9, verses 30 to 32. So when someone says, everyone today is saved looking backward to the cross, just as everyone in time past was saved looking forward to the cross, the very people the Lord himself is talking to, and he says to them, right, isn't that what happens? He literally tells them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, He's going to be killed, He's going to rise again the third day. He tells them that less than three years before it's going to happen, and did they understand it? They didn't understand it. So can you then tell me that everyone before the cross understood the gospel that we understand today? They just didn't. It is simply soft, mushy, unscriptural thinking to say that everyone before the cross understood the cross the way we do today. It, 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 it's simply not so. Go back with me to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. What Ephesians 3, 6 is saying is that during the dispensation of grace, God is forming a body, a church, the body of Christ, and that in that body, Jews and Gentiles are fellow heirs. In other words, they're equal. We'll come back to Ephesians 3, but get Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15, verse 22, And behold, a woman of Canaan 
came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. So it's a woman of Canaan. She's a Gentile woman. Notice verse 23. But he answered her, Not a word. So she comes to him. She requests help. And if verse 23 is correct, what does he do? He doesn't even answer her. I mean, you might think that's kind of rude. He, he doesn't even answer her. Not so much as a word. Let's keep reading. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. So she speaks to the Lord. He doesn't answer her. She doesn't give up. She goes to the disciples and says, Make him help me. Make him help me. Make him help me. And so what do they say? Lord, would you just deal with this? Take care. I mean, she's going to bother us the rest of the day if you don't do something. That's essentially what they're saying. What does the Lord say in verse 24? In verse 24, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What he's saying there is, I'm not being rude, but we are in time past, according to Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. Just because it's in the so-called New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this entire time frame prior to Paul's revelation is time past according to Ephesians 2. And the Lord essentially says, living in time past, there is a middle wall of partition between Israel and Gentiles. Jesus Christ was sent only to whom? Israel. So when the Gentile woman comes to him and says, help me, there's nothing for him to do. The middle wall of partition was still erected, Israel is God's chosen people. Gentiles are without hope. Why? Because they are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Now, to be clear, could the Gentile fix that? Yes, because they could join themselves to Israel. Esther 8.17 tells you that there are Gentiles that became Jews. They weren't beforehand, but they could become a Jew. So if someone was a Gentile and decided to remain a Gentile, they have rejected the opportunity available to them, haven't they? Because they had the ability to become a Jew. So when the woman of Canaan comes to the Lord, he answers her not a word because he's not going to violate the scriptural principle of what he should be doing at the time. Matthew 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. So now he's going to answer her. Notice this. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Have you ever seen that one, you know, put into a sticker you can put on your refrigerator? Because it's encouraging. What, what is he saying there? When he says it's not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. He's saying, I, I can't take the blessings that are intended for God's people, the children of Israel, and give them to Gentile dogs that are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Who do, who do those blessings belong to? They belong to Israel, so I, I What do you want me to do? I can't do this. It would be wrong to do this. God made a covenant with Israel. Israel is the, who's entitled to those blessings. I can't just take them from them and give them to you. That's what he's saying. He's not being cruel. Next verse. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She says, Oh, I get it. I am a Gentile dog, but I can be blessed because... The crumbs that fall from Israel's table, those I can have. Now notice verse 28. 
Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So what is Matthew 15 telling us? Did Jesus Christ love the woman of Canaan? Of course he did. But he wasn't going to violate God's word to help her. When she, when she approaches him directly as a Gentile, he doesn't even answer her. When she says, wait a minute, what I'm looking for is I'm looking not to be blessed as one of the children, but to be blessed as a dog that can obtain a crumb from the table, he solves the problem that very hour. Now, everything in Matthew 15 is scriptural. Everything in Matthew 15 is proper. But let me ask you this question. Does Matthew 15 say that the Gentiles are fellow heirs? It says the exact opposite of that, doesn't it? It actually says that they're not entitled to the blessings that belong to Israel because what are they? They're dogs. What they get at most is crumbs. Now, go back to Ephesians 3 with me if you would. Ephesians 3, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Well, th th that's just absolutely not what Matthew 15 says. See, people want to pretend that Paul comes along later and he does the exact same thing that was going on before him, and it's just not so. It's not even close to being so. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, that's the body of Christ, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Verse 7, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Verse 8, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So Paul says that there was a grace given to him, there's a ministry given to him, and it is that he should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So let's first start with among the Gentiles. Were any of the twelve, well, let's just do it this way, get Matthew 10, get Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Matthew 10 does not involve preaching among the Gentiles. It's a command not to do that. Now, the second part of Ephesians 3.8, the last phrase, says the unsearchable riches of Christ. Get John chapter 5. So what Paul was given to preach is what is called the unsearchable riches of Christ. I want you to notice one thing with me. So in John chapter 5, the Lord, during His earthly ministry, is dealing with some folks that do not believe that He is the Christ. They don't believe that he is the Son of God. In John 5, 39, he says, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. What he's saying there is, audience, you believe the Old Testament. You think that you're justified on the basis of the Old Testament. Well, if you actually read the Old Testament, who does it point to? It points to Jesus of Nazareth. So when you think of Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a son is given. When you think of the Old Testament that says that the, the Christ would be of the seed of David, that he would be from the tribe of Judah, that he would be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. In, in other words, what the Old Testament does is it has prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. 
It tells you he'll be born in the city of Bethlehem. So, if you're right here before the cross, and you truly believe the Old Testament, and what it says about the Messiah, what should you think about Jesus Christ? He's the one. He fulfills verse after verse after verse of the Old Testament, and he's the only one that can possibly be the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. That's why what the Lord says in John 5, when he's dealing with Israel, you guys claim to believe the Old Testament. Search the scriptures, because if you do, they will point to me. What he's really showing them is they don't really believe the Old Testament. But in John 5, he tells them to search the scriptures. In Ephesians 3.8, what does Paul say that Paul preached? The unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, if they are unsearchable, guess what? They can't be done. They can't be searched. And the reason why they can't be searched is the mystery given to Paul is not contained in the Old Testament. Now, I just wanted to pause there and then make this point. Isn't there a fundamental difference between search the Scriptures because you can read about it and you can't even find it in the Scriptures? People want to say that the Twelve and Paul are teaching the same thing. They are not. Look at Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, now notice this, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So the mystery was not hid in the Scriptures, it was hid in God. If you look at verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. So verse 3 says the mystery was made known to Paul. Verse 9 says it was hid in God from the beginning of the world. So between here and here, how many people knew the mystery? None. So could the 12, it's not just that the 12 didn't teach it, it was impossible for them to know it because it was hit at that time. Now I say all that to, to say this. If you read Ephesians 3 and you just read it for what it says, doesn't it demonstrate beyond doubt that Paul had information that was new and different from Peter and the Twelve? It, it, it demonstrates that again and again and again. What most of churchianity does is they take Peter's revelation, Peter and the Twelves and Paul's, which are different, and they mush them together. It's like taking a square block and putting it into a round hole. Did any of you have that little play set as a, as a child where there's different shaped blocks and then different shaped holes and you have to put them in? Did anyone ever you know, try to put one and, and it wouldn't fit, and so you get out your little hammer and you beat on it? Did you ever do that? Steve, I, I suspected that. <laughs> what ends up when you do that? You mangle everything, right? You end up having to twist things. You end up making a mess. All right, so based upon all of that, we can see that Paul had distinct revelation. What I now want to do is I want to cover some of the common objections you're going to get. So if you tell people that Peter and Paul had different messages, if you tell people the dispensation of grace was revealed to Paul, people will quarrel with you about that. They'll tell you that's not true. They'll tell you they preach the exact same thing. Get Galatians 2. And one of the things that they'll commonly tell you is, well, there's only one gospel. So they must have preached the same thing. Look at Galatians 2, 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. They had different gospels, obviously. The prefix un means not. So Paul said he had the gospel of the not circumcision. 
Peter had the gospel of the circumcision. Are those two, do those two words have the same meaning? They're opposites, aren't they? So obviously there were different gospels. Now go back with me to Ephesians 3.9. I want to show you a second objection that people will raise. Ephesians 3, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, now notice this part carefully, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles, plural, and prophets by the Spirit. And what they'll say is, look, it wasn't just given to Paul, it was given to the twelve, it was given to all the apostles, because it says holy apostles, plural. And so therefore, it wasn't just Paul. Well, the, the, the first thing you know is, if you just read what those apostles did compared to what Paul did, you know that they're different. But what's the answer to this question? Why does it say apostles, plural? Get Acts 14. Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, verse 14. Which, when the apostles, plural, and then what does it say? Barnabas and Paul. So are there, is there more than one apostle that had the message that was given to Paul? Paul received it first, obviously, but did Barnabas travel with him and help him? Yes. Was Barnabas also an apostle? Yes. So when Ephesians 3, 5 is talking about holy ap apostles, plural, it's not talking about the twelve, it's talking about Paul and Barnabas and the other apostles that taught the revelation of the mystery. Let me show you something similar. Get Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Well, in verse 11, there's more than one apostle, it's apostles. There's more than one prophet, it's prophets. And what were they given to do? To perfect the saints for the work of the ministry. And then it says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So were those apostles... Can that be these over here? The body of Christ hadn't even been revealed at that point. What Ephesians 4 is saying when God gave apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers is simply this. When Paul received the revelation of the mystery, that exact moment, how many people on earth knew about the mystery? Just one. Now, if you think about Ephesians 3, 9, the charge given to Paul was to make all men see. So that's a rather stark thing, isn't it? God gives the information to Paul, and, and at least when God gave the, the revelation to Moses, who was Moses supposed to make it known to? Israel, which is a, a smaller, finite group in one area. That was much easier, wouldn't you say? What God does with Paul is he says, I'm giving you the revelation of the mystery, but your responsibility is to make all men see. This was before Facebook. <laughs> That's quite a charge, isn't it? How do you make the whole world see? Now, by the way, let me, let me ask you this other question. When Paul was preaching the revelation of the mystery, how many books in the Old Testament could he use to explain it? None, right? Because the mystery was hid. It was unsearchable. So it's like, you know, Saul's there. He's like, well, thanks, God. So you want me to take this mystery. You want to make it known to the whole world. It's not written in any book, and I'm responsible to make all men see. Well, th that seems like a lot, <laughs> doesn't it? So Ephesians 4, notice this. Let's just look at 11. Let's keep reading. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till, so it's going to end, 
till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What God did during the early days of the body of Christ before the Word of God had been completed, that in other words, Paul had written all of his epistles and the New Testament was complete, is he gave the body of Christ supernatural ability to understand doctrine. He gave them apostles, he gave them prophets, he gave them pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints that they could grow in understanding to edify the body of Christ. He had to give those gifts because there were no written scriptures, right? Now, Paul quotes the Old Testament to show how that some of these, the, the, the things that he's doing are not inconsistent with that, but you understand that they don't contain the revelation of the mystery. That's obviously the case. So what God did is for a period of time, He gave the body of Christ those gifts, but those gifts then ceased. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, what allows us today to be in the unity of the faith? The written Word of God. See, here's here's the simplest way. When, When people talk about unity today, here's the simplest way to have unity, and really the only way to have unity. God's Word is around the world. The way the body of Christ can be united is if everyone just believes, follows, and lives by the Word of God, there would be unity in the body of Christ because the Word of God is the same everywhere. The reason why there's not unity in the body of Christ is guess what the vast majority of the body of Christ is doing? (laughs) They're not following the directions God has given, and that's the reason that there's not unity in the body of Christ. Get with me 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, I I remind you again that people want to say that, well, what Paul did is Paul just taught the exact same things as Peter. He just came along later. Read 2 Peter 3.15 and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. Wasn't the whole point of that verse to say that Paul had special wisdom that was given unto him? Now, by the way, you see how the first part of the verse says, account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. When Peter writes to the kingdom church that was formed during the early part of the book of Acts, He has to account for the fact that this hasn't happened. Right? During the Lord's earthly ministry, he says multiple times, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. You can read that in in Matthew multiple times. And the things that have to be fulfilled are these events right here. When he says, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled, what he's literally saying is, there are people today that are alive right now that are going to see the fulfillment of all the events prophesied in Matthew 24. They'll see the sun turn to darkness, the moon to blood. They'll see the stars fall from heaven. The second coming will occur all within their lifetime because this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And guess what happens? They live on, they live on, they live on. And how many of those things are fulfilled? Zippo. Why are none of those things fulfilled? Because Jesus Christ was mistaken? Because God was a liar? Well, the reason why, account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. In other words, what God did, when Israel stoned Stephen, God is fully justified in saying, You rejected the witness of God the Father in the Old Testament. You rejected the witness of God the Son at the cross when you crucified Him. And you rejected the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the early part of the book of Acts. I'm done. You fully deserve what is about to happen. Right? They had earned it. They they, they had behaved exactly as prophecy indicated they would behave. And judgment is going to fall. But what God did in His immense grace is said, Not yet. I'm going to insert the dispensation of grace 
And I will perform all those things in the future, but what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to offer amnesty to the entire world, not simply to Israel, but to Gentiles as well. Verse 15 is Peter, excuse me, yeah, it's Peter acknowledging exactly what Paul's ministry is. He's acknowledging the existence of the dispensation of grace. Read it one more time. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. That's what he's doing. Instead of pouring out judgment, this is a time of salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, see that wisdom is different than what Peter had, hath written unto you. Verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood. Well, don't tell me that Peter and Paul are teaching the exact same thing when Peter says, yeah, this guy had new wisdom and some of it's hard to understand. It's, it's not the same. It's just absolutely not the same. Get Romans 6, 16, verse 7. Romans 16, verse 7. Now, if you haven't had someone use this on you yet, they're going to, so it's, it's, I can tell you this is coming. Romans 16, verse 7. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, look at this last part, who also were in Christ before me. And so people say, aha, there were people in Christ before Paul, so therefore the body of Christ had to begin before Paul. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Guess what happened as a result of Adam's sin? Guess how much of humanity died? All of it. For anyone throughout time to be saved, who do they have to be in? Christ, right? For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Doesn't Ephesians 1 tell you that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, all things in heaven and earth shall be gathered together, where? In Christ. So the point of Romans 16, 7 simply is this. If you're not in Christ, guess what you're not? You're not saved. Anyone throughout time that is redeemed is in Christ. What Romans 16, 7 is talking about, it's not saying that those people were in the body of Christ before Paul. It's simply saying these were people that were saved under the kingdom program before Paul, but they couldn't have been in the body of Christ. And I'll show you why that is. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, and look at verse 16. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, notice, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. When Paul says me first there, is, is Paul writing that because he's just an egomaniac and it's all about him and that's what he's doing? Or is he saying me first because Paul is the first member of the body of Christ who was given the revelation of the mystery, the dispensation of grace? Well, it's rather obvious that that's what's going on. Galatians 1. I want to show you another objection. Galatians chapter 1. Verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 
As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now here's what people do with that verse. They'll say, well, if you say that Peter is preaching a different gospel, then by that very verse, Paul is saying, let him be accursed. Is that actually what the verse says? Look at verse 8 again. Now go to verse, start in verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now read verse 8 very carefully. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. So now let me ask you a question. During the Lord's earthly ministry, how many different gospels are there by which you, someone can be saved? One. During the 70th week, how many Gospels are there by which someone can be saved? One. Now, here's the tricky question. During the time period of the book of Acts, how many different Gospels are there by which different people are saved during that time? Two. And Galatians 2 tells you that, doesn't it? Because Peter has the gospel of the circumcision, Paul has the gospel of the uncircumcision. Now today, how many gospels are there by which you can be saved? One. So now look at verse 8 one more time. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. In other words, when Paul went to the Gentiles and Peter went to the Jews, each of their audiences had only one gospel by which they could be saved. So when Paul went to the Gentiles, the Gentiles needed to believe Paul's gospel. When Peter went to the Jews, the Jews needed to believe Peter's gospel. What Paul is doing there in Galatians 1 is he's not cursing Peter, but he is saying this, if someone took Peter's gospel meant for Israel and preached it unto the Gentiles, that would be wrong. Because in Acts 15, when Paul and the twelve reached their agreement in Jerusalem and they gave to him the right hands of fellowship that he should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision, they had an agreement. If someone said, well, I'm going to violate that agreement and I'm going to preach the wrong gospel to those folks, that's what Paul's saying, let him be accursed. See, that's actually a great proof verse for the fact that during the period of the book of Acts, there were two Gospels in effect. And by the way, this is in Galatians 1. The very next chapter, Galatians 2, tells you the agreement between Paul and the Twelve. All right, just a little bit more here. Let's look at... Uh, one more thing here. So, look with me at, at Jude chapter 3, or verse 3, I'm sorry. Jude verse 3. Jude verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And so what people say about that is, well, there was a faith delivered to the saints, and it was only delivered once, and there's only, you know, saints is saints. There's only one group of saints in the Bible. They're all saints. Now, is that a true statement? Look with me, at, you're in Jude, look at verse 14. 
And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And read verse 15 before we go on. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of, their, of all their ungodly deeds. When Jude 14 refers to the Lord coming with his saints, who are those saints? They're angels. They're angels, and you can know that because if you read Matthew 24 and 25, what you see is that at the second coming, the Lord returns with angels with the armies of heaven. Jude 14, the saints in that verse cannot be the body of Christ. So look at verse 14. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam. So that's right over here, right? And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these. Did Enoch prophesy of the existence of the body of Christ? The body of Christ which was hid in God, which was a mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. No, it's a different group of saints. There's, there are different groups of saints in the scriptures. Let me show you one, one more proof that there are different saints. Get Revelation 20, verse 9. What I'm simply showing you here is that God at different times in history has different groups of people. Revelation 20, verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Who are those saints? Well, those saints are obviously believers during the millennium. Again, has nothing to do with the body of Christ. Where are we going to be at that point? We're going to be in heaven. So let me pull this all together. If you believe the Scriptures, Paul received different revelation that was distinct from what had previously been revealed. The reason why this matters is that Scripture commands different people to do different things. To take the simplest example, are there people in the Old Testament commanded to eat a vegetarian diet? And then some that are commanded to eat an, an omnivore diet? And then some that are given clean animals and unclean animals? Yes. There are different series of instructions. In order to please God, you need to do what He told you to do. If I spend my life doing something God didn't tell me to do, He's not impressed. If I decide, you know, God, on the authority of Leviticus, I'm going to offer an animal sacrifice for my sins, is that something He would be pleased with? It's insulting today, isn't it? If I said on the authority of Leviticus 11, I'm, I'm going to create a Levitical priesthood and we're going to worship you, God, according to what Leviticus says. That's actually unbelief, isn't it? Because I'm refusing to acknowledge the revelation given to Paul. What Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 14, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. If I reject that, by definition, I'm not spiritual. I'm in rebellion. So it does matter uh, that we rightly divide the word of truth. Amen? Amen? Thank you for your patience, saints. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for, thank you for just the, the, the joy and the glory of living during the dispensation of grace. We pray, Lord, that we would be busy uh, standing for the gospel, telling people the truth, and we pray that you would be adding to the numbers in the body of Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So what I want to do, let, let's stand together, and we're going to sing. We're going to sing, Christ is all that he claimed to be.